so with that, I'm going to turn things over to our two special guests, Natalie Zedrew and Diana Ng. Thank you so much, Harry, and thank you everyone for joining us. I'm going to start our presentation up. Um, hopefully you'll find some fun things to do with your kids. Um, so welcome to our live session of STEM chat. Um, STEM stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Mathematics, and it's something that Natalie and I have always been interested in. Yes, I actually first met Diana through working on Craft Magazine. I interviewed her for an article in our primer issue. And so that was like 15 plus years ago. And ever since then, we've always loved sharing information, especially when I had my daughter. And my daughter is 12 now. So um, Diana would text me um, something cool that was STEM related that I could use with her. Yeah, and when I had kids, I have a toddler and a first grader now. I started asking Natalie about what sort of things she did with her daughter when she was my daughter's age. So because of this exchange over the years, um, we thought it'd be fun to create a video series to bring to life all these uh, STEM messages and, and tips that we've shared with each other to parents everywhere. Yep, and we hope to inspire, motivate, and encourage kids to be curious about the world of STEM, which I think is nice, especially these days. Um, it's really nice to feel inspired. Yes, so in this live presentation, we're gonna share with you some highlights from our previous episodes. But if you wanna dive deeper, um, everything we've covered on STEM Chat is on Adafruit's YouTube channel. And we also have a new uh, Instagram, uh, Instagram account at STEM Chat. Um, we categorize each episode into themes and some of the previous themes we've had are learning through play and paper geometry. Uh, we're also going to include some extra things that we're currently working on and some things that we're excited about. So we're going to talk, uh, I'm sorry, we're going to start by talking about origami, which you're probably all familiar with. We love origami and we featured it in our episode two of paper geometry. Yep, and it's a great hands-on way to learn about math, um, as you can see my toddler demonstrating. So origami teaches kids about shapes and partitioning shapes. Um, you can see here, two squares make up a rectangle. Fractions, um, you can see how the square is broken up into four, as well as parallel lines. Angles and parts of a shape, sides and vertices. And it really helps with spatial reasoning, 2D and 3D shapes. Origami helps to build dexterity, which also helps with early writing skills, which although are technically not STEM, we're all pro learning here. So my daughter and I also did origami when she was little. Um, and it's just really fun to do. It's like a fun craft project. It's very relaxing. It's like a family bonding experience. Yep, and um, I actually started doing origami with my youngest daughter when she was under one year old because I found this book on Amazon Japan and it showed um, kids who seemed like they were almost babies doing origami and had all sorts of activities you could do with them. Um, they were tearing the paper, they were crumpling it up and making different shapes and making like ice cream in an ice cream cone and um, cutting the paper into shapes and then arranging them to make pictures. So you can see my daughter here, um, she's threading a piece of paper that she folded up um, through a ring and folding the paper. Uh, it's really been interesting uh, trying it so young with her. Um, I'd always thought that the paper was very precious and would only try to make a really perfect thing. But after I read this book, I thought, oh, I'll give her a pack of paper and we'll treat it like a toy and just let her do what she wants with it. And it's been really nice. So I love this because I don't think I did origami with my daughter until she was a little older. And it kind of goes with the um, STEM concept of tinkering. And tinkering is all about experimenting, using all the materials, making something, using your hands. So it's the same way. It's sort of like toddler origami tinkering. <laughs> yes, yes, it is. Um, so we want to share some of the things that we made um, at the Origami USA Unconference. We both attended virtually this summer. So that was a fun thing about the, the pandemic was that usually this conference takes place in New York City. I'm in the Bay Area in California. So um, we were able to do it virtually together and, um, and, and to make something, which actually helped also inspire our paper, paper geometry episode because we experienced that whole uh, conference online. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, we had lots of fun during the conference. We were like texting back and forth during the workshops and being like, oh, did you get that step? I missed that step. So it was fun. Yeah, so my daughter and I love doing paper cranes. It's um, just on different prints of paper and she wanted to do like a, a wonderful crane kind of like a mobile for her room. 
Um, so that's one of the projects we do together. And during the conference, um, well, go ahead. You you can show what you oh, did. Okay. The conference first. Um, yes. So um, these were pieces from Robert Langstar Modular Opus. 817. Um, and this one has six pieces in it. And this one has many more. I don't quite remember how many. Um, but this is very interesting because the way you assemble it is you twist the pieces together. And you can see a demonstration of it on our episode two um, STEM chat video. Yeah. And if you don't know, Robert Lang is a famous American physicist, but he also is an origami expert slash artist. And his work in origami is simply beautiful. And um, I couldn't, uh, I didn't have time to go back and like finish that, that uh, project. But in the meantime, I uh, took an Australian artist's um, origami session and made a koala. And I was really intimidated. I wasn't sure if I would be able to make it, but it was, it was really satisfying to finish the one hour session and, and think, okay, this little square paper turned into a little koala. And um, that's what's um, great about paper crafts and arts. Um, and especially when um, going to um, paper prism animals, which is a great way to learn geometry. Go back to the presentation really quick. Yeah. So uh, my daughter is in seventh grade and uh, in the fall before they started the um, learning about geometry, um, they made paper prison animals. And through this project, she learned really amazing things. Not only did she learn um, more things about math and geometry, but just the design and engineering process. And um, what we did was she wanted to make a lion and we went online to Google Photos and this photo became our inspiration. And she actually was like, okay, I got it now. I, I can make this lion and the cylinders are gonna be the legs, you know, rectangle prism for the body. And um, I was like, can do a hexagon for the face? And then she's like, oh, you know what? I want the face to kind of pop out. And so I'm gonna make a trapezoid. So I thought that was so amazing that, you know, their ima kids' imaginations are like, they're just, you know, free to go. And so she just went around and she sketched everything out and then used her compass to create, you know, precise mathematical um, paper, you know, flat paper. We used um, actually origami larger format paper, um, 12 by 12. And she created all the pieces, made a template for the cylinder, you know, for each of the pieces, cut them out and we assembled it together. So she was, it was just amazing to see the process of it. And I think there's something about, um, for kids learning, seeing it visually and making something, it really helps them understand the concepts better. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, it's really neat here. You can really see how the 2D shape became a 3D shape. Yeah, and then also, you know, they're able to learn it before they're starting to, you know, before you get intimidated by getting a piece of paper with all these, you know, mathematical equations on it, or we're like, oh, I can understand it better because I've made it within, in pieces of paper. Yeah, um, my daughter started making some prisms too in kindergarten. They were able to choose um, a shape and um, my daughter chose a cylinder and then they brought it home and cut it out and assembled it and made it into a picture. So it's oh, that's really, great. You know, you could do it at all ages. Yeah, and I think, so this, with this project, I'd say probably for an older child, if with help, maybe like, you know, eight years old and up. Um, for younger kids, we have um, a link on our second episode in the YouTube description to plenty of templates. So you can download, you know, rectangle, rectangles, uh, pris uh, triangle prisms, and kids can cut it out and then they can draw faces on it. They can make it their own animals. And, you know, it's not complicated. It's really fun for them, but it really helps them understand the whole spatial um, of geometry. Yeah, and I, I think for younger kids, it's nice too, because it's kind of like a surprise um, to have the flat 2D shape, and then it looks very different from how you imagine the 3D shape looking. So it's nice to see. That's true. Okay, so we've started having some adventures in our backyard. Um, it's a little harder to get out these days to museums and zoos and other fun places during the pandemic. Um, and we were looking at Phyllis Ma's Mushroom and Friends 2 zine. And it has these fantastical landscapes um, that are made with mushrooms and fruit and vegetables. Um, and it's really nice because she's made these whimsical scenes with things that actually exist in real life. So we decided to have a little adventure of our own in our backyard and forage for some mushrooms. And I had my kids wear gloves because I'm not really familiar with the different types of mushrooms. Um, so I made sure that the mushrooms didn't actually touch their skin. 
And after we found the mushrooms, um, we looked at them with our pocket microscopes. So the image in the middle is magnified 20 to 60 times, and the video on the right is magnified 100 to 250 times. That's cool to see. And even if you can't like, you know, forage for mushrooms around your neighborhood, you can just go look in your fridge. Maybe you have mushrooms there, you have onion skins, put it under a microscope, let kids explore. Yeah, yeah. there's all sorts of neat things in there. Now, and this is a cross section of a mushroom. They cut one in half. So what did your kids like about the whole mushroom foraging experience? Well, they really like collecting the mushrooms. They thought finding them was so much fun. It was kind of almost like they were searching for Easter eggs or something. Um, and they also like sorting the different types and um, when they, they would find a new one, they'd see if it was one they had found before. My toddler had a difficult time looking through the viewfinder of the pocket microscope. And so um, there's a clip you can get and it actually clips over the lens on your camera um, I'm sorry, the lens on your camera of your cell phone, and then you can snap it into place in the viewfinder and you can view um, on your cell phone screen what you would view through the uh, viewfinder. So that was very helpful. If you have a young child, that's a really helpful thing to get. Yeah, and another thing I have also is a digital microscope and it's got a stand here, but it also can come off and it can connect to your phone or tablet and you can go outside with this or you know have stuff in your house and you can look at it and you'll be able to see the image on the actual um, device too. That's neat. We're gonna have to get one of those next. So continuing with the theme of going outside, I think um, my daughter's doing remote learning. So to give her a break from the screen, um, hours on, of screen time, we like to take walks and she loves to look at um, flowers and all the, the you know nature around us. And so there's an app called Seek where you can actually roll it over any plant and even insects and it'll tell you what the name is. And so we had a pro did I do a project where she got to take pictures of her favorite um, interesting plants that she liked and she picked the red hot poker um, as her project to draw. So she has photos of it and then she drew it and she added some facts. And it's kind of a great way to prolonged activity. So we're taking a break and we're taking a nice walk and then you can come back home, look at your photos you took, you know, they're getting some photography experience and then they're also drawing it, finding the facts and putting in their book. book. Oh, it's so nice. Then, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, it's nice she made this field guide. She can look at it when she gets older. Yeah, and she actually does, she loves like documenting all these things. And I have another friend who, her daughter is also 12. She was like, I need something to do with her. I need to do something with her. And she, I gave her this idea and her daughter, um, they live in Marin County, lots of nature around there. And they took a nice walk around and her daughter was inspired by, saw a sunflower and took a photo of it. And also with an instant camera. And then she likes to paint. So she painted a little canvas of a sunflower. So whatever media you wanna do, but I love that it's bringing in, you know, all the children's artistic side too. Yeah, and it's really nice to get outdoors and walk around too. Of course. That's good. Um, so I have a question. Does your daughter ever um, find a flower that she's documented before and then look back through her notebook um, to find out the facts? And yeah, my daughter has like an excellent memory because she actually remembers all their names, all the facts. So she'll actually end up telling me, okay, that's this plant here. Oh, this is the one I want. And this is the name of this. I'll be like, oh, so she remembers them all. And I think it's because she does this process of, you know, sketching it down, we, you know, going with the app and we get the name of it and she remembers them all. So it's been, it's been a fun experience. Oh, that's so nice too, because she'll grow up knowing about the local wildlife. Yeah, or, exactly. I guess, or the local plants at least. Yes. Okay, so we've also, we've been going on hikes um, and um, my children have go been going rock hounding when we go hiking and looking for rocks in our area. And, um, oh, what happened? Hold on just a second. Okay, here we go. Um, yeah, so when we find the rocks, they're actually pretty dirty and mostly look like regular rocks. Although one time, um, as you can see in the image on the right, we were in, I don't know, like a special area and the sand was covered in little crystals. So that was kind of neat. But for the most part, we have to clean up the rocks. So this is our setup. We have some old toothbrushes that we use and scrubber brushes. And um, we basically scrub the rocks underwater with a little bit of soap. And don't you have a rock tumbler? Yes, we do have a rock tumbler too. Um, and 
we featured it in a couple of the um, older episodes, but it turns out that my children didn't like the end result as much. Um, when the rocks were polished, they prefer to see how the rocks look naturally, but they did have a lot of fun tumbling the rocks and like getting messy, cleaning them off. That's cool. So here's a look at the rocks all cleaned off. And um, you can see, so here's some quartz that we found. It's very common in our area. And then this is a piece of feldspar, um, which or I'm not completely sure it's feldspar, but I think it's feldspar because of um, how smooth it is when the feldspar breaks, it has a very smooth um, kind of like cleavage or area where it broke. And you'll see there's also a bunch of rocks that have little sparkly bits on those, those are mica. And so I think um, once there are combinations of different things are called mica schist. So when you guys go rock hounding, how do your kids know which rocks to pick up? So I read online um, that you're supposed to go on a sunny day and then the sun will hit the rocks on the ground and kind of make them sparkle a little bit and you can pick those up and then take them home and wash them. So that's what we've been doing. Um, oh, and this rock over here, if you can see the little red dots, um, I believe those are garnets. They're very common in our area, especially um, in around like mica and feldspar. And they're also the New York State rock. Very cool. So we have uh, been looking at rocks around here and this- oh, sorry, think, hold on. It's okay. Uh, a couple of years ago, my daughter found this rock and because we're in Northern California, uh, it's got a lot of uh, pyrite in there. So it's kind of cool to see. We haven't found one since, but I think since my daughter has seen our um, rock hounding uh, episode, she's uh, on a mission to find some. Oh, that's so neat. Well, maybe we can trade the rocks one day. Yes. Um, okay, so I wanted to share my daughter's rock hounding backpack. Um, and she brings it when she goes hiking. It's kind of fun because she like wears it and it's like she's on a rock hounding adventure. And um, some of the things that she has inside. Okay, so we have this bag. It's just, I, we go through lots of Ziploc bags actually that she stores her finds in. And she has some bamboo skewers that she uses to kind of like dig the rock out of the dirt. You also have an old screwdriver so that she can pry something off of something if she needs to. And she recently added these goggles, I guess with the screwdriver to her rock hounding pack so that nothing gets in her eye if she's like really chipping away at things. And another thing that she really likes is this little rocks and minerals book. It has these beautiful images inside of all the different types of rocks and minerals. And Natalie actually told us about this series. Um, there's a whole bunch of these little DK pocket genius books. Yeah, my daughter, when she was five, she loved these books. We found in a bookstore and uh, there was dinosaurs, which was her favorite. She had like tabs of all her favorite dinosaurs. But I just thought this book was so great for kids because you're able to see large photos and great color photos of all these um, things. And then they're having the facts there too. So Diana's like brought on her collection for her kids. So I thought that was such a good tip. And I think kids that are, they like to hold small things. It feels like, and it's very light. So if they carry a couple in their backpack, it's not heavy for them either. Keeps them occupied. Yeah, and the, the photos are so nice in those books too. I think also if they can't read, they're still learning from looking at the images. Exactly. Okay, hold on, let me get back to the presentation. Okay. Okay. okay so now we were outside and I don't know about you, but the weather has been very cold here. It's been stormy. We haven't been able to get out much. so. There's no better place for STEM than in the kitchen. This is um, something we're working on for a future episode in a, in a couple months, or in the kitchen episode. And um, I, I know that sometimes kids have problems learning fractions and we do a lot of baking. We've been making bread, cookies, whatever. And my daughter loves to bake and she loves measuring everything and doing everything in the cups from when she was little till you know, even now. Um, but it's a great way to teach um, kids how all the haves make a whole. And you can see it better illustrated on, on the photo on the top right with the rice where, you know, one measuring cup of rice 
is in the same you know volume as in the pyrex um, glass pyrex you can see you know one cup of rice there below it is one and a half cups of water so like one cup in the measuring cup another half cup and you pour it in and it'll equal one and a half there. And so it's a great way to show like, you know, they're taking, you know, a quarter cups and so forth. And I have these really cool measuring spoons. I got them like years and years ago and it's a brand called Porfect, P-O-U-R. Um, and it is very precise. And so usually teaspoons are down to like quarter teaspoon. This one goes down to 1 64th and it has um, both English and metric measurements. So it's really cool to get the actual precise measurement into things and it can you know kids can play with it and and uh, see all the numbers and the measurements that's really neat. I think it's so nice to be in the kitchen especially if you have younger kids who still like to put stuff in their mouths um you could do this pouring project with uh breakfast cereal and use like cheerios and rice krispies and then you don't have to worry about them eating it can be like a snack time experiment oh yeah and then my daughter loved like when I put like food coloring and she would mix colors together. So even just adding some food coloring little cups and then she could mix yeah. it in so it would come. And then it just reinforces the whole, um, getting them used to using math and playing with math before they're, you know, later on when they have to actually be in school and use it on the worksheets. They're oh, yeah. understanding fractions better. Yes, hands on, it's always yes. nice. <laughs> Um, okay, so something we've been doing in the kitchen recently is filling balloons with different types of ingredients. So this orange balloon was filled with salt and so is the yellow balloon. And then the pink one, which you'll see in a bit, was filled with rice and the green one is filled with flour. And it's been kind of like a fun experiment in a way because the kids try to guess how the balloons are going to behave when they have the different ingredients inside of them. And then they also just get to choose whatever ingredient they want and we try to stuff it into one of the balloons. Okay, I think this project is amazing. And how did you get the ingredients into that yellow skinny balloon? That's what I want to know. <laughs> okay, um, so um, on the in the picture on the left, um, that's actually the top of a water bottle. Hmm. And we used it as a funnel because the opening is very wide. And so um, I used the same thing for the yellow balloon. But when you're making this, you want to really push down um, whatever ingredient you're using into the balloon and kind of stretch the balloon out and really compact it so that there's no extra air inside. That's cool. So what was your kid's favorite ingredient to put inside the balloons? I think it was the salt, um, because when you stretch the thing out with the salt, it just stays into position. And it, they thought it was really neat. Um, but this was also nice because um, it's kind of like a cleaner version of Play-Doh. They like to make all different shapes and like we'll bring it in the car and they'll make a bowl and then they'll like make different little things and put it in the bowl. And the cleanup is just throwing all the balloons into the balloon bin. Oh, that's cool. That's like a great little like road trip thing too, in addition to all the yeah. science behind it. Yep. Yeah. Also like sensory for the toddler. Right. Okay. Another thing we've been doing with balloons um, is that instead of a ball pit, we made a balloon pit. And it's nice because the balloons move nice and slowly. Um, so you can really see their movement and like how they fall. It's kind of like you can do some physics experiments with them and play with them too. Oh yeah, this looks so much like so much fun. Um, and probably makes a lot of sense these days since all these like indoor kids gyms are with the little ball pits are, are closed. Yes, yes. And this is, um, I looked at into getting some of the balls to make my own ball pit and I didn't know where to store them afterward. Uh, so this is really nice because you just pop all the balloons when you're done. Okay, so are you blowing all these balloons up yourself? No, I'm not. I actually have this electronic balloon pump. And so I just stick a balloon on like this. And it inflates super fast. Oh, uh, that's really cool. I, I didn't even know that those existed. That sounds like- Oh, yes. Yeah, I, I could that would be a lot of hot air <laughs> waves blowing in. Um, okay, so we've also been um, sending mail uh, and letters to lots of friends recently, and the mail is a really great way to share your interest. So here we are, we're working on a giant dinosaur letter, um, and after we finished it, we folded it up and we fit it in a first class um, size envelope and mailed it off to a friend. Um, and my older daughter here is uh, measuring out and drawing a life-size Tyrannosaurus rex tooth. And my younger daughter 
um, is gluing a dinosaur fact that we had printed out a whole bunch of different dinosaur facts and she cut them out and was gluing them on the dinosaur. But we we're actually inspired to print the dinosaur facts um, by Natalie's daughter because she had sent my daughter a card and it had some jokes in it that she had printed and cut out. Yeah, so through this pandemic, our children had become pen pals with my daughter being like the older sister mm -hmm. and um, they've been sending stuff and then my daughter got the uh, postcard of the mushroom. And so she's been into mushrooms, like just, you know, the whole theme of it and the beauty of the mushrooms. So I just love that, you know, it's also building a sense of community, sharing the art, but um, I think it's, it's fun to get a letter in the mail. Yes. Yes. Always fun to get. And, and I think this is amazing to me because I would never think to have a big scale project of a dinosaur which is in itself an activity for your child to you know, take some time for the two of them to work on, but something so grand and big scale, like an art piece, and then fold it up and send it to a friend and it's sort of like creating your own like little interactive community art, but like friendship art. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so uh, we've actually, we've been kind of thinking about what sort of things we could send in the mail because um, this is really nice. It actually, since it was in a first class letter, um, it just needed a 55 cent stamp on it and we were able to mail it. I actually stuck a second stamp on just in case, which I usually do, but it's still not bad for a dollar ten to be able to send this and share it with a friend. Um, so if you want to send something in the mail um, and send a first class letter, there's some rules you have to follow. Um, the letter needs to be machinable, which, um, means it needs to be a rectangle, not a strange shape, and also not a square. It also needs to be flexible, and it needs to have a maximum size of six and an eighth by 11 and a half by a quarter inch, and a maximum weight of 3.5 ounces, and a minimum size of three and a half inches by five inches. Um, but another fun thing that we sent, we sent a rock through the first class mail because we found some mica, um, when we were hiking and we took this little flake off and it's actually flexible. So it was, it went into our first class machinable letter. And I want to add about Diana. She doesn't just send something. She always has wonderful stamps on the envelope, which my daughter loves because she collects stamps. So they're always like STEM related stamps, either vintage um, for my daughter to collect or new ones. And I think if you go on the USPS site, you're able to like look for any kind of new STEM stamps. So you add little science onto your and your envelope as well yeah yeah the stamps actually have really nice stories behind them they're very well researched and um you know they always talk about the artist and how they design the stamps so they're really neat they're like little works of art in themselves The first thing we showed in the very first episode of STEM Chat were these Grimm's rainbow blocks. So these rainbow blocks actually became the inspiration um, for our STEM Chat content and kind of kicked us off into brainstorming all the ideas for all our different episodes. And it, it just kind of reinforced to us, as I had never seen these um, rainbow um, blocks before, that through the natural course of play that kids are learning about science and math and engineering with these rainbow arcs. Yeah, and I had a lot of fun, um, I don't know, talking to you about them, Natalie. I feel yeah. like it was really nice. And I love when it stacks together. Yeah. I never get tired of that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so in addition to the rainbow blocks, we also have these unit blocks. Um, they're the wood color blocks here. And um, they're a great way for kids to learn about math and my kids kind of play with them all together. Okay, so these are unit blocks, which means that one block is made out of two blocks or even four blocks. And it's a great way for kids to learn about fractions and partitioning shapes. Maybe they need a rectangle block, but they don't have one so they can use two square blocks instead. And this goes back just like the same thing with the measuring cups in the kitchen, you know, the difference, you know, two half cups yeah, equals that's one right. half. That's mm -hmm. right, more hands on learning. Exactly. So at the end of each episode of STEM Chat, we um, kind of present our favorite things. So we wanted to do the same for you today. Yep, and um, we're going to start by talking about the Snack Together Robot Kits, which uh, my older daughter is obsessed with right now. 
Um, so they make all different types of kits and the kits come, um, they're mostly plastic pieces that you can cut out and then you snap together. So they don't actually need model glue or anything and they're pretty simple and easy to build. Um, it's a little difficult to line up the gears. So you just have to spend some extra time doing that. And this is what the finished robot looks like. This is a solar powered bug bot, but it actually works really well. It crawls around and um, this kit was pretty affordable too. And she's also, um, she's been building them with her relatives and friends on Zoom. Oh, that's cool. Do like a build a lot. Yeah, my daughter used to build some of those little things too. She loved them. It's really fun to do. Um, so uh, it's quarantine time and I think everyone has gotten into puzzles. And what we kind of got into was my daughter got this as a gift. It's a Harry Potter. She loves Harry Potter. It's a 3D puzzle. So um, we've actually put the pieces back in, but we built it last summer. And um, I couldn't believe that um, she could build this because, uh, okay, I've done flat puzzles. Everything was 2D. I think kids are very, they've been growing up with 3D and thinking in 3D. Um, and it was a great, you know, no screen activity. We kind of all worked together and tried to figure out the different, you know, levels and layers. And it was really fun to do. So and we want to get another one of these to, to do. And um, actually, actually, after my kids um, saw us talking about the 3D puzzle in episode one, they decided to get this puzzle for their dad for Christmas. Oh, that's cute. Wow. We had, we had a lot of fun putting it together. Yeah, it just brings a different element to puzzles. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so I wanted to bring up this new series of um, middle grade uh, chapter books. Um, for kids. It's from um, my friend Tara, Terry Selting David. We actually have a full interview with her. She's um, a friend of mine from San Francisco and she has a tinkering camp for girls and then now for boys and girls um, in the city. And um, this is her new book series. The first book came out um, called The Renegade Spy Project and it has the whole like a novel with a diverse set of girls. And so the, when you read the book, you feel like you're part of the club too. And she has about eight or nine projects per book. Um, this is to make a periscope, but it's in this comic book style. It's really fun. So, you know, it was a way for um, kids who were going to her summer camps to, and then they got too old for it. I think fourth grade is a limit or fifth grade. And this kind of like brought the stories and these ideas of STEM onto for older um, girls. It's really nice. I think it's such a great idea to be able to build a project while you're reading the book. You feel like you're one of the characters in the story. Oh, yeah. I wanted to share um, this tinker box. It's basically a box of things like paper things that we would normally be recycling. And my kids love to grab things from it and make other things. Um, and it's just a lot of fun. It's hands on and um, they get to do some paper engineering. And it's kind of like recycling it one more time before it gets actually recycled. Yeah, and then they have fun making something out of you know recycled objects. And I just, that's what I love about that. I think kids have such, uh, varied imaginations so they can, you know, they are little artists. It's amazing. Um, so this is, I want to introduce you to Chibitronics and it's um, what kids don't like stickers. I love stickers and they're actually sticker circuits. And this was like a little, um, this was an idea that Diana gave me for my daughter's 10th birthday because I didn't know what to do for a birthday party. We only had a little uh, small amount of girls over and um, all the girls did this project and actually my daughter um, did more and so would you have like the project to do you put down the sticker tape and then there's a battery in the box and a light bulb and you can light up the light up a light bulb and you really it's, it's amazing I love this um, this little kit and I actually give it to um, a lot of friends for Christmas or their birthdays because this is something that will engage kids and they're again away from a screen but they're learning and they're having fun and uh, it's pretty cool. Stickers are great. It's and I, um, you know, it's really funny because my daughter's birthday is coming up, and I just asked Natalie if she had any ideas for her birthday. <laughs> so I guess we're always sharing STEM ideas. Of course, of course. So, uh, if you want to find um, all of our episodes, it's at YouTube.com/slash Adafruit. If you just go to the menu and click playlists, you'll see STEM chat right there, and you can actually subscribe to just our playlist of episodes. And then also follow us on Instagram. We just started the account and we'll let you know um, when we have new episodes out and we'll also include some new content on Instagram as well. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much.
Thank you both. That was fantastic. Uh, we really appreciate it. Some really fantastic um, ideas. Um, we've got some questions starting to appear in the chat, so I'm going to uh, to look at those right now and uh, okay. see if uh, if you have any questions. Again, just type them in, and we will get to those. Um, so uh, here's one uh, from or two actually that are in here now. Um, <laughs> a, a comment actually first. Uh, saying no questions, this was wonderful. My son listened in and has a wish list of ideas for homeschool and his birthday now, so thank you for that. Uh, another one uh, from Lou, what you're doing is, is amazing. wonder if you were able to speak, um, uh, if you're willing to speak neuroscientifically, experientially, observationally, or even just speculatively of how, how a human mind will form differently from these enriched hands-on uh, ideas and play. Um, you know, it just, it's just interesting to, to, to think about how the kinds of activities you're talking about affect development. And so and I know you're doing this really kind of from more from the perspective as, you know, um, as, you know, professional designers and, and, uh, and moms at the same time. But I don't know, you know, what you're, if you noticed anything about the development of your children as you've introduced activities like these. Well, you know, it's funny to say that because we've been, this is our passion since, you know, before we had kids. So I start seeing it in my daughter now that, you know, she's in middle school and math to her is not a challenge. It's like, I'm going to figure this out. You know, like there is something about her generation where in her school, I think it was around first grade, they started a tinker studio. So I think, and then I, I talked to her fifth grade teacher and he said, and he had taught there for 20 years. He said, this generation, I used to see girls go, math is too hard. Um, when I don't see it in this generation of girls now because we're, we're not making them scared anymore. We're getting them hands-on, they're building things, they're figuring things out themselves and they're not afraid for, um, they, they already figured out the challenge when they were making stuff before. So when it came down to actually working on equations, they know how to do it. They know how to figure it out. That's what I found. And so I kind of told Diana, I was like, hey, you know what? It's kind of funny because we kind of were into this stuff but I, I think it, it really does work. Yeah, I think they get, they're more used to thinking about it if you start at a younger age. And so when they're older, I think they're more comfortable with it. Oh, and also, so um, kind of a related observation I noticed about my younger daughter since we started doing origami very early. She's actually, she's um, a toddler now, she's three, and she's actually pretty good at doing origami. Like, I'm, I'm, I was very surprised. I was like, oh, I didn't know you could hold those types of things when you were three. So I guess if you start really young, um, it makes it easier as you get older. Yeah, I would definitely think so. I mean, yeah, I, I wish I were doing origami back when I was three years old. I, <laughs> yeah, I think I, I it's might be fun. more mathematically oriented right now, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, another other questions have come up. Uh, let's so um, another one. How deep do you get into math concepts? Is this more experiential, or do you attempt to uh, introduce terminology? Um, you know, that kind of comprehension early on. Um, so, oh, sorry. go ahead. Okay, uh, so for my kids, because they're younger, it's more experiential. I mean, we will say some of the shape names when we're doing origami, um, but you know, I, I think it's more that I just want them to kind of understand the concept. Yeah, and I think if you are also, if you're doing a homeschool program, you can look up the standards for math for requirements and you can use kind of like what, we, what we've kind of shown as examples and you can add in the terminology if you think it's appropriate for their age level. I think as they get older, you might want to say, okay, you know, these are the actual fractions. Maybe I'll write the equations on the side here for you and then also show you with the measuring cups so you can relate the, the, what I'm doing in the kitchen to what's on the paper next to you. I think that's a really important point because that was, that was another question I was thinking about is, you know, maybe, you know, how to connect this, you know, more to, um, to actual curriculum that the parents are dealing with, whether they're, you know, doing um, homework with their kids at home that they're getting from virtual schooling or if they're homeschooling kids, you know, and trying to kind of meet those re curriculum requirements. So I think that's a really good point to, mm -hmm. to find ways of connecting it. And so I was interested to see that you were talking about PRISMs, which is something that, you know, we introduced, uh, that we were doing when we were doing live in-person tours in the museum uh, with oh, geometrical cool. sculptures and, and glass objects in our collection. So yeah, I think that's really great that you brought that out because I think it, it's, it's terrific to kind of connect some of these ideas back when you can to, to actual curriculum, again, if you're mm -hmm. a parent um, or, or a teacher actually looking for engaging activities like this. Exactly. Uh, one more um, question that came, uh, just came in a minute ago. How do you store your rock collections? 
um, and uh, comment, you know, very inspiring possibilities you shared with us tonight. So how do you store your rock collections? Well, so right now it is um, it is kind of like collections. We have so many that we found um, since we've been hiking a lot, but um, most of our rocks we have in a big wooden tray that has sections in it. However, we also have a large Ikea bin of rocks that have yet to be cleaned that are in our um, guest bathroom bathtub. <laughs> Yeah, so that's, that can be a challenge when you collect things. Uh, I know because I make art out of recycled plastic pieces oh. and, and, out and all that good stuff. So yes, <laughs> that is a yes. challenge when you start yeah, acquiring yeah, things. Ones. <laughs> uh, any other questions tonight? Uh, let's see. Um, I think I've gotten the ones that, that have been put in here. Um, there was another one kind of followed from a previous question. You know, um, will we also say that having, having fun is really important to the formation of of a person, you know, pertaining to, you know, that that STEM mind, you know, as as children grow, I think I think fun is is probably a pretty important part of this. Oh yes, I, I think it's it's a key thing, and I've I've taught so many craft projects. Um, we used to have an event called Maker Fair, and the craft area would be where all the kids came. And I've taught craft projects to older, you know, women, and kids are not afraid to try anything. They will they will actually even make something that you never even thought could be made because. So I love that their imaginations are open. I think that's why we try to want, you know, come up with themes where we can make it easy, especially during this pandemic, you know, it's not, we can't really go to museums. We can't really go, you know, kids can't really, sometimes they can't even be in school. So what are things we can do at home for them to kind of supplement and help them have fun? They're learning um, and um, they're busy. They're keeping busy primarily without a screen all the time. Yeah, I think fun is kind of like the best motivator too. Um, it's like you really want to, I feel like I want my children to be curious. And so if they're like curious and have questions, then they'll kind of do the work to find the answer. Right, and, and one more question. How do you organize all of these activities? Do you try to keep everything separated and pulled out at set times or are they just sort of available always, I guess, depending on the the age of, age of your child, um, uh, are they just kind of always out there available to them or do you set aside time or you know, place, um, separate these activities out? So, well, Diana talked about it in our first episode. You should talk about oh, that. Yeah, yeah. so um, I actually have all of the toys um, set out, like the blocks, so the kids just go up and get those on their own. But for messier projects, um, you know, we'll have like a designated experiment time. <laughs> <laughs> with stuff set up to help us keep a little bit neater. And I guess like also scrubbing the rocks in the bathroom, I usually try to sit in the bathroom with them when they're doing that or it just becomes a disaster. I think it also depends on your child. If you think, you know, sometimes when they, if they see it around too much, they may not know. So putting things out, you know, maybe on a pick a table or their playroom or something, maybe every week you switch things out that are like little projects that they can do. And it's kind of like, oh, it's new again. And you can rotate them around too. Yeah, yeah, we just, we actually just, um, after Christmas, we started, we have kind of like a large shelf with all the toys and we do kind of a toy rotation. But then um, my older daughter had gotten a microscope and the younger daughter got some magnifying glasses. So we set up like a little science corner and they were very excited about it. That's great. Yeah, it's it, it, again, it, it is a challenge, I imagine, to keep all of this organized, but um, but fantastic projects. I mean, I was really struck by many of them. Uh, another thank you from, from one of our participants. Um, uh, one of the projects that I was struck by was the uh, the mail art um, piece. I think that's a really great one that I think a lot of people have rediscovered during the pandemic. I know we have a an exhibition of mail art from oh, folks really? from different, different age levels from kids up through um, older adults um, that's up right now. Um, so, but, I, but it seems that that's really had sort of a resurgence. Um, so is that something that you were, you were thinking about uh, in terms of that project? Is that, have you seen other mail art come your way or is just like, you know, our kids are pen pals and this really is a good way to, to make that um, connection? Uh, well, so I've always kind of been following it online. Um, I, I guess I went to a stamp convention several years ago and I was like, oh, these stamps are interesting. And I was kind of thinking about other things you could mail because um, I think someone said you can mail like a box of candy, like some of the candy actually fits within the first class mail requirements or maybe you put some extra stamps on. So it's kind of been like a fun challenge to see what you can mail. I think some of our next things we're planning to do, we're going to send like a secret coded letter with the 
key in it to one of my daughter's friends. And then we may also mail some snacks so my younger daughter can have snack time on FaceTime. That's what cool. That's actually reminds me of this book. There's actually like a whole spy project and I have like a code oh. cipher that you can make. So you okay, can maybe, actually, we'll, maybe we'll I do that. I sent this book to Diana to read with yeah. her girls as a gift and you can actually make a whole code key and then you can decode the messages with each other. That's neat. Okay, we'll, we'll look up that chapter. Maybe we'll do that for our... We'll look forward to future episodes of STEM Chat. And um, any other questions before we, uh, we uh, finish up for the evening? Uh, you can put them in there now. Um, but um, I, you know, I, I really look forward to seeing... Uh, what you both come up with next. It's just a fantastic idea and one, again, that just seems so fitting for the times we're, we're living through right now, particularly, but I think anytime, uh, I think parents you know, are looking for ways to engage their, their children. Um, and I, and I, I, could see you, I could see you both developing uh, kits uh, for, uh, for parents uh, down the road as well. So um, that's something else, just a suggestion I had to put out there for our, uh, our audience to um, also look at your local institutions, you know, libraries, museums and others, and those who may not be able to offer in-person programs right now, many of them are producing um, kits with activities, including STEM activities that you can uh, arrange to um, pick up uh, and use at home. So uh, I know that's something we'll be doing here this coming weekend. Uh, we have a free admission three-day weekend to spread out the period so that people aren't coming in all at one time, uh, and we're producing um, kits uh, with STEM-based activities that parents can pick up and take home rather than having the crowded activity tables that we used to have in the museum for programs like that. So, um, so I would definitely encourage folks to look for those kinds of things um, out there um, wherever you are as well. But um, I want to thank you both tonight um, for a really fantastic program, fantastic ideas. Uh, and um, I had one more question here. Um, looks like a uh, question of uh, related to coding, but I, it doesn't look like you're quite getting into that uh, yet. Um, with, we uh, have we have stuff planned for future episodes. I mean, my daughter has done coding. They did start. They do start young now, um, and it's a funny thing because my daughter uh, was really into these. There's these robots called Dot and Dash, and uh, Diana's uh, older daughter now is into it. And so the two of them have FaceTimed, and Chloe uh, has done little experiments to show her what can be done. So there are, and I I think I really like these robots. I think they have at the Children's Museum in San Francisco. And um, you're able to visually see how to code. It's very visual and manipulate a robot. So my daughter has done stuff where she's had the robot come in the kitchen to say, hi, mom. And then she can record her voice and go back. But it's just the beginning of that kind of stuff. But I think also for us, it's not, we don't, we're not necessarily pushing any kids to be just, you know, coders or whatever. We want to explore all aspects of STEM, uh, nature and everything around us, especially at this time. Yeah, it's yeah, a good I, time I think, to, uh, go ahead. <laughs> oh, sorry. Oh, I was gonna say, I think some of the early coding too is uh, about just kind of moving around in to different spaces. Because um, we actually, so we got the dot and dash robot after Natalie's daughter um, demoed it. And um, it's, I think some of the initial things you're just saying to the robot, like, you know, go forward two and then to the right three. Yeah, I think robots are where a lot of kids kind of got their start, you know, kind of just starting to get interested in coding. I know mm -hmm. I remember that with, with my son, uh, but, um, but yeah, I mean, uh, that's something that, that, again, they can build on over time, but I think that uh, right now it probably is important for kids to get outside and, and yeah. uh, connect with the natural world um, as much as they can, given how much time we're spending on screens. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, again, I want to thank you all for spending some screen time with us tonight. <laughs> and um, I wanted to um, let you know that we will be um, releasing the video. If you know folks who'd like to see this, who haven't seen it yet, uh, we're participating tonight, that is. Um, uh, we will have this available on Telford Museum's YouTube channel in the near future. And you may be seeing it through other, other um, avenues as well. And um, please look out for uh, Diana and Natalie uh, on STEM Chat uh, on the web series. Uh, and. Uh, check out the, uh, the great projects that do, they're doing in future episodes. So um, thank you all for joining us tonight. I uh, hope you have a great evening and uh, please um, check out our schedule for more of Pulse. We have more virtual uh, talks and a couple of virtual STEM workshops uh, that we're doing on Saturday with the Society of Women Engineers here in, in Savannah, Georgia. So uh, thanks everyone. And uh, we hope you have a good evening and uh, we'll thank hopefully you. see you again soon. Have a good thanks night. Thanks for having us. Right, thank you so much. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.